I'd like to welcome everybody to our Tuesday night Zoom meeting of Camberley Chess Club. Um, I think we're up to about, I don't know, is it 30? I can't remember how many we've done so far. Martin, can you remember? Uh, at, at least 48. We're coming up to yeah. the 50th in a year. Yeah. So, so that's pretty good. Um, tonight, we are lucky to have Ken Coates. Well, I hope we're lucky to have Ken Coates. Yeah, even though we were on. Uh, who will talk about probably the Mora Gambit. So over to you, Ken. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is going to be a bit of a wander through the um, the Mora Gambit. I've... Uh, I've played it myself, but I've also um, specialised in playing against it as well. And um, uh, I, I, I did a bit of research of, of with um, uh, two people who, who... Richard Webb started playing it about a year or two ago, um, but also a good friend of mine called Char Charlie Kenner, Charles Kenner, used to play it all the time. And he reckoned it was a, an excellent weapon to play against the Sicilian. He, a lot of people thought that it just lost a pawn, and I will talk about that a little bit later. But he always thought you got enough play for the pawn. Um, whether you got enough, more than a, a, a pawn's worth of play for it, and then could go on and win, that, that was questionable. But he, he certainly got some uh, very good and very interesting games. Um, I hope you can see the... Uh, See the screen, yeah. Okay, and um, what I'll do is uh, just before we start, I'll give you a little bit of history about it. Um, I'd never heard of Pierre Mora, born in 1900 and died in 1969, but apparently he was a, a, a French player, and it's after him that the Mora Gambit is named, although to be fair. Uh, it, the, op the opening was played by Tartakova, uh, who, who used to come up with some crazy gambit stuff himself. Um, and also it was uh, specialised by a Yugoslav called Matulovic. And in fact, at different times, it was called the Tartakova Gambit and the Matulovic Gambit. But the person who contributed a lot for it was a guy called Ken Smith, who was uh, born in 1930 in... Uh, in uh, Texas, yeah, and he played for the Dallas Ch Chess Club, and he wrote a whole series of uh, books and um, articles about the Mora Gambit, and it became in the in the United States known as the Smith Mora Gambit, whereas in I guess in Europe and certainly the UK we just tend to call it the Mora Gambit. He doesn't get a mention, although he did contribute quite a fair about to the theory. The only problem is for Ken Smith is that in um, in 19, let's get the year for you. 72. Sorry? 72. Yeah, it was, 19, you're right, 1972 in uh, a, 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 big, a big tournament, international tournament in San Antonio. Okay. He, because he was playing oh, a load of players, decided to deliberately play the, the uh, Sicilian because, and, and three of the main ones that he played against were Donald Byrne, Larry Evans, and Henrik Mecking, all three very strong players. And um, they sort of said that every time he played the Mora Gambit, it was just like getting a free pawn. In fact, one of them, I believe, actually changed from playing his normal intended opening to playing the Sicilian, just just so you got to play against the Mora Gambit and win a pawn. Um, so, but unfortunately, after that, you know, the idea that the Mora Gambit is just a free pawn um, became um, it became I would say a little bit ridiculed um, yeah, it, that it wasn't you know it wasn't proper chess. You know, it was just it was okay for blitz and playing in coffee house or something like that, but. But not really a proper one. Can, I, can I, I just, Ken? I was just going to add that in in the tournament book, the, the um, San Antonio 1972, the game um, Porti, sorry, uh, Smith 
Portish yeah. was annotated by Larson. Yeah. And uh, the game went E4, E6. And um, Larson put a question mark by E6, saying uh, C5, X gland winning a pawn. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite so similar. Um, I think I think what I'd like to do is just sort of give a um, a sort of a setup position. These are the first the first moves. The white white how white plays e4 and then c5 he played immediately d4 now in this position you don't have to take a you could play a declined ver variation with knight uh, f6 and in fact that that is actually quite popular in fact it would be it's what um since uh nick pert took up playing the uh sicilian because uh, he didn't like like losing in the french or getting bored to death with the exchange variation from Richard or myself, Richard Webb or myself. Uh, he always plays knight f6 in this position, declines it that way, which is a perfectly adequate way of doing it. Uh, after, uh, But uh, the main line is just to take on d4, and then white immediately goes hell for leather and offers a, this second pawn here. After takes, knight takes. And this is sort of like the start position of the Morrigan bit. Of course, you know, if we move on a few, a few, a few moves, you'll see where White puts his pieces, and we'll we'll go through some game, games in a minute. But essentially, you know, Black Black can play other moves, but Knight C6 is as good as any other. Knight F3, uh, the E6 is always a useful move for Black because Bishop here now doesn't go and hit F7, okay. D6, okay. Castles, knight f6, okay. The queen often goes to e2, although we'll see in a, a game I've got later. Um, this may not be um, the, it's it's best square. It depends. It depends what black does actually. A6 is a useful move because when the rook comes to d1 like this, that d pawn's under a bit of pressure, and it's going to have to move the queen out of that pin. And now you see you don't want annoying moves like knight b5 happening, hitting the queen. However, white often continues to his bishop there. Rook here, castles. And uh, white often just drops the bishop back so that they've got some sort of... Um, you've now got a position whereby there might be some threats happening here with moves like knight, even knight d5 coming and also perhaps e5 coming okay um and black often ends up playing here just to get his queen out of danger from those two rooks but this this position is very often what the white players play um almost automatically to put their pieces on these squares and and to be fair they are on pretty good squares but like many things you could that one one size of shoe doesn't fit everyone you can't always play the same moves against every defence by black. And I wasn't going to go through a big, long uh, expose of all the different defences that black can adopt, but this is probably pretty much a fairly standard position that the white players, if they don't understand the subtleties of how to play against different defences, then, the, then for this sort of setup, and have to be very careful that the move... Uh, by white of e5 doesn't break open their position horribly. Okay. So what what have people got for this position? Well, the two rooks are certainly well placed and there's pre pressure down the c and the d file. The bishop on f4 is on a, a pretty good square. And if you look at it, the black queen is a bit awkward for squares on, on, on b7, but it's the, they're just holding things. However, in the long term, with Black's pawns on e6 and, uh, and d6, you've got a Schwavningen type setup where Black's got two pawns in the centre and is controlling an awful lot of squares. So, you know, these type of positions, as most Sicilian players will know, offer some prospects because the e6 and d6 pawns control an awful lot of the centre. Okay? 
and white might have some trouble trying to get get some sort of attack going okay? we'll have a look at some 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 uh, other games as well in a minute but certainly this is a position that offers some prospect and in fact in some positions black will even play knight e5 as quite a disruptive move because if that if if that got taken with knight and f3 takes e5 and d takes the pawns on e5 and e6 form quite a, a good barrier um, to a lot of whites attacking play so you know i, I if i was I, when i used to um, play this a few years ago i i would near i would play for these type of shaving and positions and wait for white to go e5 and uh, and just play those positions but there are there are some antidotes to that I mean, there is one person I think is worth mentioning in the Mori Gambit, and that's um, an American uh, IM called Mark Esserman. He's about the strongest player I know who regularly, regularly plays the uh, um, plays the Mori Gambit, and he plays him in some quite quite strong tournaments as well. And I've actually got a game that's uh, of one of his against um, a very strong Dutch player, Luke van Veli. And uh, he's, uh, and, and Mark Esserman absolutely crushes him with the Mora. It's well worth seeing. It's a real surprise game. Um, but M Mark Esserman has done a lot, an awful lot for theory. And he has got a book out called uh, Mayhem in the Mora, which is, is okay. I'm not quite sure about his writing style. He he, uh, he, tr he makes out that everything should be referred back to uh, James Bond quotes and stuff like that. But but he's certainly done an awful lot of work to resurrect some of the lines which were thought to be just simply good for black. So here's a so this is re remember this this is the sort of position that white by default would probably play for. Okay. Okay. Um, what I I'll do uh, if if. If black gets it wrong, they can go down very, very quickly in the morrow. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to change this now. I think I have to reshare the screen if I'm going to do it. So let me bring the next screen up. Okay. And I think it's this one. Whoops. No, sorry. Wrong one. I'll just get the screen ready. Whoop. Get loads of right right let me share i'll start sharing again now okay i believe it's oh i'm gonna make sure it's the right one now it's hard to tell they all start in the same position <laughs> i think it's this one Has that just moved E4? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I guess the right one. Okay. Right. So here's... Um, let, me, I'll go, let me turn this uh, to its off. Right. For those of you who might think about uh, playing the Mora in uh, maybe a Blitz game or a friendly game or something like that, here's the sort of things that um, Black needs to avoid. Yeah? Badly. Here. D4. Okay takes c3 takes takes these moves these moves are fairly easy to play knight c6 is good is honestly as good as any knight f3 here here black decides to play d6 okay which is okay but you need to combine it with e6 and probably a6 as well bishop c4 notice how the pieces are going towards the sort of direction that I suggested earlier. Knight f6 here. Now, really, Black has made, uh, hasn't, what, what's Black done wrong here? He's got both his knights out. So he hasn't really done anything wrong here. He's made two sensible development moves. But unfortunately, the position is, uh, allows White a bit of a, bit of a tactic here. 
And, and many, many games have been won by the White Mora players in this position, just by simply by paying the move E5 here. This actually, believe it or not, causes, causes Black a lot of problems here. Okay? Not, it's not clear at all what, uh, what one should do. Okay? In fact, prob objectively, uh, we're going to look at taking that E pawn. But probably knight g4 or even knight d7 have to be played, in which case the position isn't particularly nice after um, d takes e, d takes e and castles and bringing a rook to e1. The whole thing is looking a bit horrible. But just to show how badly you can go down here, of course, okay, and okay, we'll, we'll look at knight takes e5, which, which we can dispense with very quickly. Yeah, after knight takes e5 and knight takes and pawn takes, okay, white has a, cr the, a crushing blow here, okay, which is a, probably an idea that ma many of you have seen before. But simply, bishop f7 has won many games in this position, and the queen is, and black's queen is lost, okay. Black has gone down many times in this position. Yeah. This bishop's sacrifice on f7 is, is decisive. There goes the queen. Okay. Which is why a lot of the Moro players like to play this. The other point, of course, with, with this would be to play d takes e5. Okay. And after d takes e5, you would think as white, you would try and keep the queens on, but actually, no, you you swap the queens off. And now this is quite, this is an incredibly difficult position for black. I'll show you the amusing one first, because, because not, knight, knight takes is, has, has been played several times. And now simply go knight b5. Oops, what's happening on c7 now? This position is getting very, very difficult. Okay. You might be able to grovel on a little bit with rook b8 here, but just to show you how how the whole position can fall apart so so horribly. Um, a, a popular move by Black here, which is tantamount to resignation, is to try and guard um, c7 with the king. Yeah. When unfortunately, black meets his end very, very quickly. Again, this is this is uh, has been played dozens of times. Simply knight e five check, king e eight, and knight c seven is actually mate. Okay, another trick that uh, the people like to play for. So that's that's very quite. Whoops. Okay. The other thing that black can do in it is, is try rook takes. But again, after knight takes pawn and bishop, bishop f4, the position is very, very difficult. Very difficult for black. The other, the other, another line in here might be to simply, simply play king d8. But black's position again is, is quite horrible here because knight here. Very, very hard to stop here. A possible continuation might be to go here. And now you've got two moves. Bishop, both bishop e2 and bishop takes F, f7 are both, both probably quite good to play. The only, the, the only, the only way there would have been to stop that would have been after... Well, let's have a look. It was bishop e2... Let's have a look. Bishop e2. Okay. The only way to stop that f pawn going now probably is to play bishop e6. And now I think you can see that black's position is a bit of a going to be a bit of a mess in a minute. We've got this lovely um, pawn center of e5, e6, and e7. And the um, 
Black can't get his bishop out on f8. And if he can't get the bishop out on f8 very easily, he won't get his rook out in the corner. And White's pieces um, are going to have a real big uh, advantage in this position. So, so here's a good example of how to get it horribly wrong in, in, uh, in the Mora Gambit. So what are we going to do about this? Well, Tim Davies said, what, what would I play in this position if I was black? What would I try and do? So I'll try and give you an, an idea and a, a, that black, what black can play against the Mora Gambit that's definitely worth an outing, okay? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna switch to a different screen, and I can't just trade them over. I think I've got to completely stop it and start it again. So, okay, right. This is the one I want, which I think is this. Okay. And just to say that the uh, triple pawns was described as the Irish pawn centre by Tony Miles. Yeah, yeah, it it, it does it does control an awful lot of squares on the D and the F file, but unfortunately, it's very easy to mo motor straight down the middle of it and eat the E E E five E six and E seven pawns. Yes, right, okay. What I'm going to show you now is actually um, a line against it, and then we're, and then I'll show you a little bit of the la very latest theory of it. Um, this this for some reason, uh, presumably because it was first played in uh, in in this part of Russia, is known as the uh, Siberian defense to the Morrigan bit. Okay, so we'll have a look at this. Again, if you if you're trying to play as black, this is definitely worth a bit of an outing. I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll show you the the trap itself, which is quite has been uh, has happened to a lot of uh, white Mora players many times. Uh, takes, takes, takes. Knight takes. Ken. Uh, yeah. We're not seeing a chessboard. Are you not? No. Oh, all right. Let me let me see if I can. Okay. Oh, I'm pressed share. That's why. Is it, are you seeing it now? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Right. I'll go. Just go back for the uh, to the start then. Okay. Right. Okay. E4, C5. Okay. If you if you if you're black and you're going to play against against the Mora, okay. You can take this. Take it. Then start with knight C6. Okay. Knight f3. I, 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 don't know that, I don't think there's anything significant about whether they play bishop c4. Uh, that. Oh, one, one little thing, yeah? In this position, yes? Um, something that Peter Tart might like to try in this position, yeah? Which has been played before, is actually bishop c4. It's the sort of outrageous nonsense that he would probably go for, okay? Uh, with a sort of like a Danish gambit type thing. I, I, can't, I can't agree with it. I mean, going one pawn down is, is, bad, is bad enough, but uh, two pawns down. But um, I'm sure there will be some people who might play it, even, even at Blitz, but... Uh, But let's look at the main line, knight c6, knight f3, e6, okay? This is always a sensible precaution, especially if white's going to put the bishop on, uh, on c4, okay? In many, many lines of the Sicilian, as soon as the bishop goes to c4, you, you play e6 as it bites on granite at e6. It's, uh, it saves you getting done horribly in various lines. Okay, right. Uh, I'm gonna. F I'm. Sh I'll show you the, the. We'll. We'll have a look at the the main line first. Okay, which is Queen C C seven, and then I'll. I'll show you White's improvement, and then 
we'll have a and then show you what what black can do a, 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 about it castles knight f6 and now we have a bit of a um a a, a, a sort of parting of the ways now because okay what always used to be played here okay and what you really like white to do is queen e2 the idea is that they're going to go for that um, standard position that I first showed, where the where the uh, rook on f1 goes to d1. But in fact, if you think look of it now, um, the rook on d1 doesn't actually um, hunt down the queen on d8 in any way, shape, or form. So already you start to question whether this is White's you know right way of playing things. However, in this position. It's well well worth knowing about a little um, a little trap here, okay? Called a Siberian trap. In this position, you can play knight g4. Okay. Now, believe it or not, a very very popular move in this position is h3, simply driving the knight away. Okay, John, do you want to turn them on? Because somebody, uh, see, uh, I'll give, I'll give, I'll give twenty points for anyone who can find Black's best move in this position. Knight g four. Yeah, I'm sure some, I'm sure many of you spot it, but it's it happens in quite a lot of positions. This, yeah, knight d four. Whoops, yeah, and now unfortunately, you can't play knight takes knight because of queen h two check made okay and any other move with the, the queen you can go knight takes knight check followed by queen h2 check so knight d4 just simply wins in this position there's nothing that nothing white can do in fact i the i think the first time i saw this game was when i was uh, i played in about 1992 in a tournament in spalding and we had a collection of chess players down from Leeds University, one of which was uh, a guy called Charlie Picard, who now plays for sort of Cambridge. And um, I, I remember, I remember that he got into a position something similar to this. And after he played Knight Takes Knight, the 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 boy he was playing as Black had to literally stand up on his chair. To be able to reach over with his queen to the other side of the board to play queen h2, mate. <laughs> yeah, the kid was so small. Yeah, but he'd obviously been well coached and knew, knew about this trap. Poor Charlie fell hook, line, and sinker straight into it. So, so this is the Siberian trap, and I think it's well worth an outing. Yeah? But going back to it, you see, the problem is that in this position, White actually has a, a really quite good move here found, found by Mark Esserman. You don't have to play queen e2, okay? White has actually got in this position a much better better move, okay? Or, no, actually, maybe, maybe I, should, I should show you some other lines here because after here, okay, knight here, don't, you don't have to play h3. What about if white plays in this position? Knight. Well, let's have a look at some bad moves for black here. I mean, this move, uh, where is he? Knight b5. Okay. Okay. Black simply drops the queen back to b8 with, and the threat's on again, will be on again. And white's getting his pieces tangled up. a6 might happen and b5 might happen. Here. And if this move, black can just simply ignore it all and play eight, H, H5 here with a, sim, with a similar idea. And in a minute, what white can play. So I, I think this position is perfectly fine for black here. Obviously, you, you wouldn't now play the knight back to C3 or anything like that. Because uh, this knight d4 is just going to win again, and a6 and b5 is going to be quite quite reasonable to play. 
So another 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 poor idea in this position. If if white sees knight d4 coming in this position is uh, is rook d1. That doesn't turn out to be awfully good either, because now bishop c5 and now f2 is under a terrible threat, and this this position has to be uh, you know has to be quite nice for uh, for black to play. Okay. So, you know, white, white can go badly wrong and fall in, in, and I would imagine quite a few people will fall into the, um, the uh, Siberian uh, gambit here. But let's go back and have a look here, because in this position, if you were thinking of playing this as white, you have to know that Knight b5 is thought of very highly as being a good move here. Okay. However, you might say, oh, well, I don't want to play this Siberian gambit because of this particular line. But I'll show you in a minute that by black playing around with his move order, yeah, white can end up in a end up playing it playing this um, into the Siberian gambit anyway. After here, here. And now Mark Esselman came up with this move, brave move. He does say he does say he would much prefer it if people um, if people took this this pawn now, and if they do take it, knight takes, queen takes. That's a second pawn now, but unfortunately, this position isn't very good for black. Very very hard hard to play. Okay. Rookie one, and where does the queen go? Queen c5 is probably best, hitting the bishop. But oddly enough, this position proves more difficult for black than it would have first, um, the, uh, first you'd think of, because, because Esselman's found this move. Bishop f1. You know, if you're going to go on the attack, you don't see retreating moves like that. But the whole point is, that the um, the bishop are on uh, c1 is going to move, then a rook's going to come come to uh, c1, and the poor queen's going to be in all sorts of terrible trouble here. And also, black has to do something something about knight c7. Okay, bishop g5, purely and simply to uh, try and get some sort of smothered mate on. Uh, that so for instance a move like um here queen b4 might go down horribly quickly but um, black black has to play this move now to get out um because a move like for example queen here okay might be simply met by the devastating queen takes knight okay Whoops. Or where else can we put it? Maybe we maybe even Queen here also goes down horribly. Queen takes knight. Queen takes knight here, mate. So there's an awful lot that can go go wrong for um for for black if the white white players know what they're doing. So yeah, the the Mora Gambit I still think has got a lot of lot of punch to it okay so what do we do there we had a look at that we'll look at this f6 rookie white's move off turned out to be usually quite 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 sensible here to here okay now there is it now now at least by giving himself f7 he's not got to, he's not got the horrible mate on there now Whoops. So bishop here. The idea is to try try and play uh, bishop f6, uh, d6 here, and attack the queen. And if queen takes, check. Note, note that's in this line, the bishop on c8 is, is, is loose as well. So 
Black is more or less forced to do that. This is one of Esselman's games that he played. I mean, in his book, which is quite, it's quite good read. He's got some good ideas in it. Um, the only thing that's a little bit disappointing is a, a lot of the lines he gives, he's only, um, he's only really played them in, in online blitz tournaments. Okay. So you think, mm, you know, if you really played that against a really strong player, would you, would you really, really be, uh, you yeah, know, would it work? But in this queen d4, knight here, bishop here, rook d4, queen here, rook, rook d1. Now he goes for the kill here and night check. And unfortunately, in this position, black's black's black might be um, a piece up, but he just can't unscramble his pieces in this position. And the very simple idea of of white playing a four. Okay, it's not. It's, let's look at d5, a4, uh, followed by a5, and black's position it just completely falls apart. And uh, this is another quick win for uh, Esselman in one of his games. So you have to be very, very, very careful in this. I just want to go back now because you might think, well, I'm not sure about the Scandinavian. This is what happens to it. But you can actually you can actually do something to avoid it, which the the moral players don't don't know about yet. Okay. And that is in 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 this position, okay. Don't put your queen into danger on C7 too early. Yeah. If if you were to play knight f6 here, okay, which is just a uh, altering your move, transposing your move order, okay. Now black and uh, white has a little bit of a challenge to know what to do, okay, because if they go queen e2, of course, you can go back queen c7, and now you're in the Siberian trap again. If they do, if that, for example, they go castle, you've got you've got this knight g4 move again. So, yeah, so you've just transposed them back into it. Also, Ken, yes, uh, uh, there was a question uh, in the chat about why not playing g3 against the uh, against this trap. Yep, I'm sure. You, where's that? After h3 or g3? g3 after knight g4. And g3 now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. H, H5. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that. Yeah, it may not be a move you really, really ideally want to play, but um, I don't know. Is it is is this where you you might uh, you H5. might decide to play H five anyway? <coughs> H five looks like a it might be a sort of uh, a move to uh, play here. But certainly, certainly it avoids it avoids the immediate trap. I will agree with that. Yeah. yeah, Ken, you aren't claiming the blacks winning or anything. You're you're just showing some traps, aren't you? Yeah, I'm just I'm just playing for some traps. I'm not saying blacks definitely in a a, a winning position here, but I'm just showing you some i some traps and ideas in here that 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 might be might be quite uh, reasonable. Okay. Bishop Bishop C four might be. Uh, Okay, here as well. Bishop c5, sorry. But I don't think these positions. Remember, black, 
you know, Black's Black's not under any terrible, horrible pressure here at the moment. And he's certainly not get, getting creamed by it. Okay. But yeah, G, G3 is probably a sensible way to avoid a lot of the trouble that uh, that's heading his way. I would agree. Okay. Right. Um, but I, I think I think that I think that trap, particularly with, by playing knight f six before queen c seven, and get see if you can get white to transpose back into queen e two, and then uh, that way I think is well worth an outing. Because many many white players will automatically play queen e two, and rook and and rook d one not realising that it's possibly a, a bit of a mistake. So I think there's a great possibility to catch some people there in, in either blitz tournaments or even proper over-the-board matches. Okay? Right. One game, if you, if you were thinking about taking, taking up the Morrow, Morrow let, me, um, let me just uh, have a... Okay. I'll show you. I'll show you a game that certainly impressed me uh, when I saw it. Okay, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was a very. Okay, right. This is the game between um, um, Esselman and uh, Luke Van Veli who's a very strong Dutch player. Okay. And uh, even the, even Van Veli went, went straight for it and just took the pawn. In fact, to be fair, many people, uh, many strong players, rather, um, how should we say, are disrespectful of, uh, of the Mora Gambit. Um, I've got lines that I quite like playing. I think, I think if you're prepared to dig in and defend, yeah, yeah, and you, and then try and grind grind out an extra pawn in the ending, yeah, you've got prospect. But it's a long, long, you long, long way to go and a lot of hard work to do. But I, um, okay, which is why I would probably see if I could set some sort of horrible trap for them to fall into. In this game. Okay, much today, but this game by by Esselman I thought was very impressive. Bishop here. Okay, Black Black's just defending quite, getting his pieces out. Okay, knight here. Now this was at one time thought to be pretty much a refutation of the Mora Gambit, playing the knight to this square. Um, the even the fact that you know it, it looks a bit strange because if the white could, knight could suddenly jump to d d6 it's mate yeah but it, it just doesn't happen in fact i i remember seeing a game of um who who um uh, what's his name ben Hague, very very strong talented player he he one of the few english players i know plays the mora gambit quite quite a bit and uh, he, I remember seeing one game where he took, uh, he shot Jim Plaskett to the cleaners with it, and Pla and this is the line that Plaskett played. Okay. Bishop here. This is the idea. And now knight here. Now, now black can stick one, one, and then the other knight on the e5 square if he needs to. Okay, so this is. This is a, a very much a, a well-respected way of playing it. Bishop here, just dropping the bishop back out of trouble because when a knight does drop there, it's going to uh, it's going to hit the bishop on c5, b5. Okay, already a bit of a hint that um, black is going for uh, some sort of uh, as you was expansion on the queen side, and now. Esselman, prepared analysis, of course, this is. Esselman jumps in with knight d5. 
Now, I think that's just an unbelievable move, just putting the knight on, under attack there. Just looks, it, it, you know, part of me just says this this shouldn't work, yeah. But in fact, it, it, it you know, Esselman produces a lot of analysis to show that um, this is this is quite a strong way of continu continuing here, yeah, for White. And he said some remarkable scalps, including this one. But I still think it still looks a bit crazy. I mean, he's already sacked the pawn, and now he puts a piece where it can be totally tamed. I believe Van Veli took it without too much thinking. I mean, I don't think you can leave the knight there. This should I mean, be six is coming, and you can. Sorry? This should be six is coming. Yeah, yeah. Bishop B6 is, uh, is, is certainly coming. So I think it's probably got to go. Pawn takes. Knight E5. And now this move. And what what has what has White got for his piece? Well, he's he's completely disconnected. Um, Black's development, he can't get his, and uh, he Black may even have to give something back here. You can't you can't quite get to F seven with the, uh, just yet, but it, it's certainly something that's in the air. So black plays a natural move, bishop b7, to get control of the d, d5 square back. Knight takes. Okay. Okay. In the game, uh, fe5 was, was played, but we can have a look at uh, knight d5 if you like. Um, white white intends this and says black um, and you get white gets an awful lot of play here. F four is going to be very disruptive, and when the knight moves, you know, bishop b b six check again is going to be decisive. Yeah. So certainly white's getting a lot of play here by that. So you can see why. Taking with the F pawn was Van Veli's choice, and now, you know, not not hanging about here. White just simply played F four to open lines completely to the king. Uh, I mean, there's no, there's no uh, hanging about here. This very much reminds me of a sort of Peter Tart game. Yeah, where you just you don't even you don't even really analyze. You just play the moves and see how they turn out. But it's definitely, that's a, that's a move that I could see Peter Tart playing in a, a heartbeat. He wouldn't even think about it. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be on the board before he'd even play, pressed his cloth. That was it. Bang. Now what to do here? Van Veli played Queen F6, but I'm not sure any of the other th other things are any better. This looks one of the more amusing ones because he here, yeah. Anyone li like to suggest any moves here? Bishop takes F4. Bishop takes F4. Okay, yeah. It doesn't look a bad move as well. Anyone got? Got any more surprising moves? Queen, Queen H5 looks fun. Queen H5, Martin Wellman says. <laughs> yeah, Queen H5 check. G6. That's what makes you such a dangerous player. You don't think, you, you think out the box all the time, Martin. So. Yeah. This, this is, and this is, Definitely going horrible, isn't it? You can see why Van Bailey didn't go down this. Oh. Oops. 
That surely that's the end now, isn't it? I can't see a move for black here. Yeah, oh, that's that's the end. King King takes Queen takes Rook King F seven, Rook F one, end. Huh. That, that kills that off. So Van Veli didn't play that. He played. He played Queen F six. Desperately trying to shore his position up, but don't know. It's it, it. This this all this all has got the horrible suspicion of. I've just walked into some prepared analysis here. Yeah, he really should. Yeah, he was probably regretting having played all of this and and thinking, oh my gosh, what move is it already? Can I get it to run? Can I find a way to to make it run up to about move twenty five or thirty, and then it won't get published as a miniature? But unfortunately, pawn takes, queen takes. Now, I have to say here, um, Esselman didn't play the move I would have played. I would have gone uh, in this position. I, I, I would have gone bishop f7 check, king d8, bishop b6. Okay. Uh, but I think uh, Mark Esselman must have been watching too many of Peter Tart's games. He just put played Bishop here. Which is playing playing for the flash moves. Obviously, obviously White's threat now is Bishop F7 made. Okay. He's got to take it. Sorry? He's going to take it. Black's threatening, mate, if he takes it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, maybe, maybe he should. I mean, there is, there is an interesting one here, okay? And that is, I think, this check here. Because what would you play in this check, in this position? Rook F2. Yeah, I think you have to play rook f2. Unfortunately, if they if you go king in the corner, black has the counter sack of if you go here, has got bishop takes check. And the black king and the white king's in a bit of trouble here. But I think um I think the simple simple move rook here decides straight away. Okay. So so if we have to take it, now comes a a, a really nice uh, nice series of moves now, where um, it just shows you how horrible that black king's position is and how dangerous that deep pawn on d6 is, because this check now decides. Mm. What a lovely move. Just so good, how good a, a queen is when it can dash all over the root board like this. Okay, well, there we are, and that and that really is is pretty much the end. That's the end of it. Okay, I mean, if I was Van Veli, I I I would seriously not be happy with that game because he absolutely got smashed off the board. And much of that was all prepared analysis that um, I think uh, Mark Esselman had actually played some of the game before. And in his book, he goes into quite a lot of analysis of what other moves that, uh, you know, um, Van Veli might have played that might have stood a bit more chance. But uh, I couldn't, he couldn't find any, there's no, there's no refutation of that game that, that knight d5 is 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 all the the end of it and that that's that's the final position uh, after queen e1 check can he can he put a bishop or a knight on e7 and just give a piece back yeah probably let's have a look let's go back yeah 
Yep. Okay, I'm just trying to think now what. Bishop F7. Bishop F7 check and then Bishop takes G6. Over four. Yeah. Queen A5. Trap. Yeah, Queen A5 just wins, isn't it? Oh, and here looks yeah. like Bishop yeah. takes here. Yeah. That that probably would be winning as well. I've got a feeling that in I've seen some analysis where um, he actually took he was able to take on here as well. But this this looks pretty decisive anyway, doesn't it? White's got to keep checking because White's got a mate on G2. Let's have a look. Okay, so here. Ooh. Bishop D5, maybe? Take, take that, yeah. Okay. If okay. Queen takes Bishop D6. Uh, a bit. Yeah. Bishop G6. Bishop G6? Yeah, because the king can't protect the queen. Mm. Oh, yeah, that'll do. Mm. Yeah. This is just... Uh, I mean, to, to have... To have to have beaten a, such a, a strong GM as Van Veli, you know, just knocked him completely off the board. Yeah, very, very strong. Very Ken, strange. a quick question. You, you know when you played knight d5? Yeah. I was thinking you would take back with the queen and be in a very strong position, but I didn't have time to analyse it. Can you quickly look at that? In this position? Yeah, so... so queen take with the queen? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look too bad, does it? Well, it looks very good to me. What's the defence? Threatens Queen F7. Queen E. Queen E7. Oh, is it that simple? Don't know. Probably, yeah. yeah. See, if Bishop C5, he escapes to D8 with the king now. Yeah. 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 D5, then. Sorry, say again. After queen takes pawn, queen to e7, have you got bishop to c5? Yeah. No, because, no, because d8 is, is, is it can, can escape to d8, can't it? Okay. Queen takes bishop. You can go to d8 now. Yeah. Yeah. Heads across the queen side. Yeah. 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 I was starting to think about that, and then and then we moved on to pawn takes, and I didn't, yeah. I didn't see all of that. Yeah, fine. But... But I think it's quite quite amazing that you know that this pawn is just so disruptive to Black's position. Yeah, you know, the amount of play you get, the, that that pawn is the thing that that drives that really gives Black all his problems in the position. Isn't the main problem that he hasn't really developed and got into a casting position? That's the main problem, isn't it? I, I would agree, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the king's trapped in the middle. Yeah. And of course, that, that's the thing that splits splits Black's position in two, in two parts. Uh, he, he never really recovers and gets out of it. I thought it was in, in a very impressive game from uh, uh, Mark Esserman. Um, I mean, he's the only he's the only um, person I know uh, at any sort of high level regularly plays the Moragamba. But um, and I have to say, and a lot of things in his book are, you know, here's an i here's an idea I uh, against this particular defence, and then. Um, and then he only gives an example, which is quote some blitz game from, you know, 2010 or something, an internet game, probably played all moves in 10 minutes or something like that. And you think, well, hmm, do I believe it? But he certainly had some great success with that. Okay, this is a game that I, I played uh, not that long ago, which I, I thought was not a, 
not too 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 shabby a game. And this is uh, a, a Slav defense. You're black, and I'm and I'm I'm black in this one. Yeah. Okay. And uh, a couple of people may have seen it before, but. Very popular to, uh, to to play a a a four, so you you win the pawn back. Okay, I know uh, I know um, Colin has has experimented with knight a six and other stuff like that. Very exciting though it is, but I'm I'm, I'm not totally convinced about its soundness of it, but it's certainly exciting. E six takes this is all standard stuff of course now night there um night it's either night there or or queen c7 gets gets played night there has the advantage that you're getting another piece out and the knight will go that probably go there anyway but it also means that you might be able to get the queen to e7 rather than c7 which sometimes can be quite useful the only trouble is that in some lines here queen b3 looks good but my opponent played the usual queen here now uh this this offers a little bit of a trick that black what he's going to do white's going to play is e4 and if you then try and play bishop takes knight on c3 they'll answer with uh, e4 takes f5 take the bishop so black normally drops back here so that if black plays e5 e4 in this position you've got time to take the knight and then take the pawn but even that's quite tricky because uh, white will get his bishop to a3 and certainly get quite a lot of play for it Book d1 that's uh, that's a move here, but uh, not a great time for Black's castle. I don't think White's White's played particularly aggressively in this opening, so Black's been able to get most of his moves in and get get castled. Now White's now Bishop D two. I think is a bit sort of passive, but I can sort of see why they did it. Queen E seven. Um, I talked to Nick Nick Perk quite a lot about this because he plays the Slav as well. And he reckoned it's always a pretty decent idea to play the queen to e7 if you can do, do that. Yeah. It's a much better square for the queen and and it also supports uh, e5 as well. So I was feeling quite quite happy about the queen on, on e7. For if 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 Mr. Perk recommended it, then who am I to argue? Okay, knight here. No, I okay. It's easy to just say that's just putting the knight in a stupid square, which of course it is, and and blame a lot of black white subsequent play on that. But I suppose I can sort of see why he did it. I'm going to keep that bishop, of course. Okay, so back it comes, and now I'm 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 threatening to go as in the Slav, either e five e five or c five, but. E E5 is looking better and better and better here. So he brings the knight back. So maybe knight A2 was just a waste of time. Okay, E5. Oh. Off runs the knight to go and kill the bishop on um, on G6, but I I don't I don't think it compromises Black's king's position. It just takes long for what too long for white to get lined up on, on, on the black king. Rook d8, a simple move, but sensible. Chops, only one move, chops. And queen f3. Whoops. Don't want that, sorry. Things are popping up on my screen. Okay, now I've got my. Tom Cruise, my, my sorry, I don't know what it was. I it wasn't Tom Cruise, was it? No, I didn't see it. Okay, 
Now I've got my both my rooks on good positions, and White still hasn't put put his other rook to uh, good old uh, c1. But the big question is here: Is it right to chop on d4 and weaken the d pawn, or do you play for the attack and play e5 e4? And during the game, I just really didn't know the answer. I think I think he, White's shuffling his rooks to get the other rook to d1 now. But why not d5 in that position, Ken, rather than moving the rook? Sorry, I missed that. Sorry, rather than put the rook from d1 to e1, why not d, d5? d5? Yeah. Yeah, that might be that might be a better idea, but I wonder I wonder whether you can then shut black black dark squared bishop out of the position while you wind up on the king side. Yeah. I, well, at this point I'm not still not convinced uh, I want to go up the king side yet. Okay. In fact, I just played this this move. This this has got a little trap in it. Okay. And now I might be threatened to take on d5. D4, sorry. Might be able to play E takes D4. E takes D4. Queen D6. Threading H2 and the D4. Very crude. But uh, it, it decides he it, it decides to do something about it here. And plays G3. This stops. This stops my little trap, but I. But the question is: Is is G three a, a fake, fatally weakening positional move? I mean, it looks ugly because of all the pawns on black squares, but I still, I'm still unsure whether it's. I choose to play. I choose to play it as if it was a fatally weakening kingside move. But I'm, I'm still even now not totally convinced that it is so just so so bad. So I played this move, unsure whether I was guarding against the move a five a six, or whether I was intending at some stage to go b five. I really wasn't sure, but I just thought it was a. A sensible waiting move. I didn't want to commit myself yet to playing e4. However, now white is moves his knight back to a2 again, where it's been once already, and this is to put his his bishop on b4, which would be pretty nasty in this position. So now that now the knight came round here. And it also gives my queen a square. Point B three. And now I move. Now I I thought, yeah, I can get some sort of uh, white square attack here. And a good square for the knight. Defended by both the pawn on C six and the knight. I think Black's, I was feeling quite comfortable with this, but just wasn't sure I go from here. I mean, I've put both the rooks on good squares, but now the center's blocked. So should I have done that? I'm not, not sure. Okay, rook a c1, that's just a sensible move. But it was the ne next bit that I thought was quite an interesting idea. The, the, ide the idea here I had was to hack him up the king side, particularly on the h-pawn. But it's not easy to get onto his h-pawn, as you can see. How about king h7? I thought I just thought it was all too slow. I think what I played, I've not seen the idea before, 
But I think what I played, I think might be better. I played this, G5. And then G6. And then King G7. <laughs> Same sort of idea, but I think it's more efficient. Now he starts to try and defend. And having both, spent all the time putting my two rooks in the center, I now put them, start to put them offside. Rook H8. There's nothing subtle about my moves. They're fairly direct here. Now, which to take it? Sorry? Is overrated to go for it. Well, I took with the pawn so as I could keep my e pawn. Queen here. Now I'm starting starting to think that this white squared attack looks pretty pretty promising here. So now here. Well, how do you continue? How do you continue from this position now? I obviously need more more attack on the white squares, but how to do it? What's wrong with grabbing the A, A4 pawn? Sorry? Oh, sorry. No, it's all right. Answer my own question. Well, I can't quite take the A4 at the moment. The bishop on yeah. C7 is a bit, yeah. a bit dodgy. So that I retreated the bishop so that maybe the A, A4 pawn is uh, an idea. I didn't think I was ever going to take it, but I wanted to I want him to worry about it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go rook h4 in a minute, Ken? Yeah, that, that looks like quite a quite an idea. It certainly occurred to me. Yeah, it's threatening to win something. Oh. We'll play this instead. F5. The idea is to play F5, yes. Now here, okay, I did miss an opportunity, okay, I think, because what I did, what I did do, I was starting to feel a little bit nervous with having that knight on e8, so I stuck it back again, yeah, but should I have played rook takes, rook takes, mm. rook takes, King takes and E takes F. What do you think? Hmm. Should I have should I I have done that? Sorry, Ken, after Queen takes, what am I missing? It, it looks very difficult to defend. Uh, yeah, King F6 and Queen H7 or something. No, not there. Can I yeah. play this? Yeah. Very simple threat. Don't know. I didn't play it because I didn't trust it. <laughs> very, very tempted to take it and swing the rook across. Yeah, I didn't play it because I just didn't just just didn't trust it. Does it does it work, Ken? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Is the answer? I mean, it looks dangerous, but not clearly winning. I well, know. yeah, that, I got to the point. I said I thought I can't clearly see that's winning. Whereas, whether well, this this just appealed to me as being simple. The other one is F five, isn't it? Yeah. F4, sorry. Okay. Rather than moving the knight. Two. Now, again, I g my original plan was to take with the G pawn and correct the pawns, but I then started to get slightly second thoughts about it because I thought might, they might be able to play moves like Queen G1 and perhaps run the Queen or um, and then if I took with the my G pawn, my my own king might get a bit 
naked. So what I did do, I took with the queen. Because it simply, it simply puts a third piece on h3. I couldn't see how, how he, he was going to obviously defend it. He took. Now, I didn't want to play queen takes e4 because of queen f3. So I just took back with the pawn. And now he can't defend h3. And I, and I sort of, well, I thought, I thought this sh probably should be winning now. Why, why did you not take with the knight? Is that, is that not stronger? I don't know. Let's have a look. Certainly got a threat, hasn't it? Yeah, because... Can, can he play here or something? Yeah, yeah. Try yes. And, try and yeah. play here or something? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just took with the, the D pawn mm. because it stops his queen coming to F3. Queen here. Well, I don't want the queens off here. Although, to be brutally honest, I think my pawns are a little bit better, even if, if the queens came off. But I, I, it, I might not be winning here. Queen, keeping the the what the queen on h3 seems to be decisive. And now now he plays what I can think must be a definite inaccuracy. Probably a, the the a lo, the losing move. He plays queen here, desperate to get the queens off. Kane, why didn't he play um, instead of queen? F1. F1. Why didn't he play rook c5 first? Rook c5. Yeah, I remember see, seeing that in in the uh, because in the game. then oh okay because then then if you move the queen back, then you can play queen f1. Yeah, that might be good as well. For why? Yeah, yeah, that's probably better than what he played. Yeah. Can I? I can't play here, can I? Oh yeah, maybe I can. Oh, maybe. <laughs> that might be a move. Oh. Mm. It's a move. It's a, but definitely queen uh, rook c five. I was wondering whether he had some sort of uh, some cheap move there, but <coughs> after queen queen e six. Queen here, knight d5. I think just think is that's it. I think we're all it's all, all over by the shouting now. So that's a lovely square for a knight. And e3 is just just getting wellied. I don't think there's a move here now. White suffering because he put his knight back on a2. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, you're he's playing absolutely. He's playing knight down, isn't he? Yep. Yeah, he's. It's not been. It's not been a good square. He desperately needed it back on c3 here. But I think this is all over now. By the shouting. Here. And now I could. I couldn't see anything better than the brutal rook takes pawn. Oh, what about Queen F6? Queen F6? Well, that's probably good as well, isn't it? Queen F5 must be reasonable, isn't it? Queen F5 might be good as well. Yeah, Queen F6, Queen F5. Yeah. Queen F7, even better. Yeah, Queen F7, <laughs> yeah, Queen F7 has merit. <laughs> and in this position, I I couldn't... I, I couldn't... Uh, I had. I thought I. I've, I have to play queen takes because that just leads to mate. If, 
I knew he couldn't take the night. But he did. Of course. Now now it's all now it's completely all over. But the other the other moves look very, very strong as well. And that's it. Yeah. Game's gone. Yeah, it's mate. And I never did get to take that knight on A2. I mean, the one thing I, I, I was quite pleased in that game was the way I managed to get up the H file without putting my king on the H file and moving it around like that just by creating a space with G5 and G6. I've not seen that idea before. And it suddenly occurred to me, I could just move... If I move the G pawn up, he can never play H4 and try and block the H file because that, that stops that, that idea and I can... I can shuffle the rugs across. Right, okay. What, what's the time? That's it now. 10 to 10? Ten, ten ten? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ken. Well, I hope you enjoyed some of that. Yes, thank you. Very good, Ken. Thank you. Very much, Ken. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And, and now, and Martin's reminding me why I know he's such a dangerous player. He comes up with some right <laughs> strange moves. Oh, it's nice, nice to hear that, Ken. I've not heard you say that before. Yeah, you don't think you don't think like normal people, Martin. That's the problem. <laughs> wow, that, you I, think I, your I, own that's a compliment. Yeah, that's nothing. Nothing to do with chess, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> that's what makes you such a dangerous player. You don't think. You don't think in quite the same way other people do. You play your own furrow. I'll take that as a compliment. It's probably why I can play better uh, at faster games than slower games, I think. But I'm not right. sure. Not sure. Very right good. then. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed some of those things.